friends, colleagues and students, Professor Paul Muldoon. The color. I struck the board and cried, no more, I will abroad. What shall I ever sigh and pine? My lines and life are free, free as the road, loose as the wind, as large as store. Shall I be still in soot? Have I no harvest but a thorn to let me blood and not restore what I have lost with cordial fruit? Sure, there was wine before my sighs did dry it. There was corn before my tears did drown it. Is the year only lost to me? Have I no bays to crown it? No flowers, no garlands gay, all blasted, all wasted. Not so my heart, but there is fruit and thou hast hands. Recover all thy sigh-blown age on double pleasures. Leave thy cold dispute of what is fit and not. Forsake thy cage, thy rope of sands, which petty thoughts have made, and made to thee good cable to enforce and draw and be thy law, while thou didst wink and wouldst not see. Away, take heed, I will abroad. Call in thy death's head there. Tie up thy fears. He that forbears to suit and serve his need deserves his load. But as I raved and grew more fierce and wild, at every word, me thoughts, I heard one calling child. And I replied, my Lord. Thank you so much uh, <clears throat> to the vicar of Lancaster for allowing us to be here. <clears throat> Thank you so much for all of you, uh, to all of you for coming out this evening. The plan here is to read a few poems that have a religious... Um, aspect. And uh, I, I will say that because this is a comparatively um, intimate gathering, despite the, the, the grand, uh, the, the grand uh, environs, um, please feel free, if you have any observations, queries, concerns, uh, complaints, please, please feel free to, to I was about to say, take them elsewhere. No, please feel free to, uh, to put up your hand and make a point. There is a, another microphone lurking around there. <clears throat> I thought I'd begin with that extraordinary poem <clears throat> by the great metaphysical poet, George Herbert. Um, as you know, he, um, or you may, may or may not remember, he flourished. Well, he lived between 1593. I'm not sure how, how he, if he was flourishing exactly in 1593. Uh, to 1633, a clergyman, a poet, who gave up uh, the ways of the world um, and, you know, his, his somewhat high station at birth, um, went to Trinity College, Cambridge, and um, he um, is such an extraordinary poet. In that poem, for example, um, the collar, the title of it, this restraining device, 
uh, <clears throat> which will, I hope you'll see that by the time we get to the aforementioned Francis Thompson poem, you'll see there's a little bit of a theme running through these poems of restraint, uh, our theme of, uh, uh, in fact, um, slavery in some cases, literal or metaphorical, um, of, of, in some cases, a sense of being damped down or tamped down, but only more often than not um, with a view to rising up from that and flourishing. The collar itself a pun on uh, the, the notion of the collar, the humours, of course, that were uh, the choleric, the slightly, uh, uh, what would one say, uh, the slowing down of things, the collar. These were poets who delighted in puns, as I think, as religious poets, um, <clears throat> I, I think that's only fitting. When people complain, as they sometimes do, if they think about it at all, about punning in poetry, I remind them of uh, the, the, the great punster in this regard, um, Jesus Christ. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. And my view is that if punning was appropriate for the Christ, it shouldn't be any problem for the rest of us. In any case, um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, his, his punning there is evident with the word pine. What shall I ever sigh and pine? I struck the board. The board, of course, being the table, as in bed and board. The table, and I think there's a little play there on the on the relationship between the pine, that's often used uh, as a wood for tables, not always, <coughs> more often oak, of course, but it is used at times, and the sense of pining, of sighing for something beyond oneself, right? To pine. <clears throat> In fact. Uh, for what it's worth, and it may not be much, this is a pun that works not only in English, but in Japanese. Uh, so keep an eye out for that, right? When you go over, over in that direction. So I'll, I'll read next of all a poem or two by the greatest uh, metaphysical poet, perhaps one of the greatest poets ever to have lived, my own favorite, <clears throat> John Donne. John Donne, uh, a poet I myself first read with George Herbert when I was a teenager in Northern Ireland. And that was an era when uh, <clears throat> Helen Gardner's edition of the metaphysical, I see a nodding there, the metaphysical poets was, was meat and drink to us. I'm not sure if we're still reading it at, uh, for A-level or I suspect, give me a sense. Have you read John Donne and uh, Herbert, some of the, the students here? You know, it, <clears throat> it's interesting uh, to me that <clears throat> this was deemed a reasonable, uh, what does one say, diet for, for the teenager of that era. And uh, heavens, I'm not sure how it, how, we, how it all worked out for us, but um, we certainly, we, there was a sense in my own case <clears throat> of a, a poetry that was very rambunctious, that was wild, that um, <clears throat> in Dr. Johnson's dismissive phrase about the metaphysicals, as many of you will recall, he complains actually about their tendency to yoke images by violent, heterogeneous or heterogeneous, how did we say that round here? let's say heterogeneous, <clears throat> uh, images by violence together. <clears throat> and he, of course, was complaining about that. <clears throat> I myself, and many of us uh, who were beginning to write at the time, um, thought it was the most wonderful thing to um, be able to compare, let's just in this context, remind ourselves of the one of the aspects of that, uh, the central imagery of Donne's great poem, The Flea, where he compares uh, the flea to a, 
a marriage bed and a marriage temple. And he asks his the young woman, I assume, uh, perhaps that's a, a leap too far, that he's interested in <clears throat> to, stay, uh, to stay her hand, as it were, not to kill the flea, right? Because were she to do that, she would be committing <clears throat> not only uh, be- because their blood is mingled in the flea, if you recall, she would be committing self-murder, right? She'd be killing herself in some sense. She'd be committing murder and she would be um, desecrating. She would be desecrating um, the, the temple which the flea now embodies, right? Um, it would be sacrilege to do that. Uh, this seems to me to be a really fruitful way of thinking about how poems might work by taking these far-flung ideas. <clears throat> um, so John Donne, 1572, 1631. He was an interesting character, as I'm sure many of you will know, and please forgive me if I'm bringing coals to Newcastle for many of you. <clears throat> Some of you may not, as, as it seems, would not know much about John Donne. He was, a, he was brought up as a Catholic uh, at a time, obviously, with his debts, when being a Catholic was a slightly problematic matter. And for that reason, his family were recusants, and for that reason, he went to Hart Hall in Oxford, now known as Hartford College, a college that I'm proud to be able to say of which I am a fellow. And I'm always, one of the reasons why it's such a treat to go there is to think, well, you know not perhaps on the same site, but John Down used to knock around here. And that, 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 uh, that makes me feel very good in the way that fans feel good, I suppose, when they come in, come in close-ish contact to their heroes. So, um, you know, he had a, what would one say? <clears throat> he had a, his early life was, I think it's fair to say, um, there, there was quite a bit of wine, women, and song, from, uh, from what I can make out. Um, I'm reminded, and please forgive me for bringing this up, the late George Best, who said that he, do you remember that? that he, he, he spent a lot of his money on women and alcohol. And please forgive me for bringing this up in this sacred space. The rest of it I just frittered away. It was a little bit like that. <clears throat> but this was the perfect training, perhaps, uh, at least it was a training for him to become Dean of St. Paul's, which is, one of, I, I guess, still one of the high offices in the land. And uh, along the way, of course... Towards the end of his life, in particular, he, um, he wrote some holy sonnets. And I'll read one or two of those, if I may. Does this seem like a decent enough plan for you here? Yeah. Oh, well, I'm going to do that for the next, oh, heavens, um, you know, 40 minutes or so, or maybe less. As I say, if any of you have a point you'd like to make, please feel free to do so, because it's, it's, we're family. Show me, dear Christ, thy spouse so bright and clear. What is it she which on the other shore goes richly painted? Or which robbed and tore laments and mourns in Germany and here? Sleeps she a thousand, then peeps up one year? Is she self-truth and heirs, not new, now out war? Doth she, and did she, and shall she evermore on one 
on seven or on no hill appear? Dwells, dwells she with us or like adventuring knights first travail we to seek and then make love? Betray, kind husband, thy spouse to our sights and let mine amorous soul court thy mild dove. Who is most true and pleasing to thee, then when she is embraced and open to most men. And you can hear there <clears throat> in that poem that's musing upon, I, I think actually at, at its heart, some uh, di distinctions between the way Protestants uh, and Catholics viewed the world, those seven hills of Rome, but he ends up with that image which, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, I think harks, it's a naughty little image there at the end, right? In the midst of this holy poem, right? And that's one of his great strengths is that he sees that it's all part of one wonderful big thing, right? I mean, what might in some uh, senses, some intellections be thought of <clears throat> as the sacred and the, and the profane. In any case, um, oh, to vex me, contraries meet in one. That's one of his greatest gifts, that very thought. Contraries meet in one. Or perhaps contraries. Contraries, I think he would have said. Inconstancy unnaturally hath begot a constant habit that when I would not I change in vows and in devotion. As humorous is my contrition as my profane love and as soon forgot, as riddlingly distempered, cold and hot, as praying, as mute, as infinite, as none. I durst not view heaven yesterday and today in prayers and flattering speeches. I court God. Tomorrow I quake with true fear of his rod. So my devout fits come and go away like a fantastic ague. Save that here, those are my best days when I shake with fear a master of the paradox, a theme that we see through a number of these poems. The rod that's meant, and true fear of his rod, let me just shift gear and, and move to uh, Phyllis Wheatley, a poet uh, who lived between 1753, 1784, definitely not flourishing in the early part of her life. <clears throat> and she was... Um, picked up in somewhere in West Africa, not exactly sure, possibly Gambia, and, and enslaved, brought to uh, America. Uh, she, she was the first um, African-American uh, writer uh, to, to uh, author of a book of poems, Phyllis Wheatley. Um, and uh, her take on that um, is on her being on being brought from Africa to America, you know, is no less engaged by uh, wit, irony, paradox than some of those poets we we've, we've just been listening to, <coughs> Herbert and Dunn. So this is Phyllis Wheatley. You know, one of the first things we have to figure out with a poem in any era, including the present, is who is speaking this poem, A. B, are we to take them seriously? I mean, we live in an era, it's fair to say, well, I live in the US, so maybe I'm <clears throat> out of touch. But let's put it like this. It's difficult enough to um, <clears throat> find a sense of irony in the world we live in. 
it seems to be quite cut and dried one way or the other. People um, seem to mean only what they say, and that's not necessarily, most of the time that's a good thing, but to be able to understand that uh, actually there's a little irony going on here is also a very useful <coughs> commodity. Anyway, on being brought from Africa to America by Phyllis Wheatley. "'Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a Savior too. Once I redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. Remember, Christians, Negroes, black as Cain, may be refined and join the angelic train. Very powerful poem. You know, <clears throat> as I read it there, <clears throat> I realize, and this happened, did you want to make a point? Oh, I thought you might have been putting up your hand. I would have been relieved not to talk for a minute or two. Uh, <clears throat> so, I hadn't actually, I, I, you know, I was looking at this earlier on, because I did actually prepare these remarks, <laughs> just in case you're wondering. I was reading this poem earlier on, and as with many, as with many poems, uh, I find, you know, I, I've read, you know, this poem again and again, and indeed I was looking up, I was thinking about the word refined. And, uh, of course, you know, it means to free from impurities. And I started to think, um, I wonder when sugar cane was first introduced into the American system. And, and of course I discovered, alas, that it was introduced certainly in the West Indies in the 16th, you know, it was happening in the 16th, into the 17th century. And you know, as I read this poem uh, earlier, <coughs> there was a word I completely missed. And the word is kin, C-A-I-N, which of course seems to be most obviously <clears throat> related to Cain and Abel, but is a, a yet again, I think, I think, I think, I think it's a pun on sugar refining, sugar cane and sugar refining. In any case, so, um, so in other words, they may be refined <clears throat> and the, the darker aspect associated with raw sugar will be refined um, usually, by the way, through, and I think this is still the case, through you, the use of animal parts. Are any of you up on sugar refinement? You probably don't want to be, actually. You probably don't. Yeah. Anyway, the, uh, um, <clears throat> that, that I think is still often, is still used. But in any case, an extraordinary, what a witty poem by Phyllis Wheatley. Now, I'll go to another uh, favorite woman, a poet of mine. <clears throat> and uh, I think I'm going to read this poem, if you don't mind, uh, uh, on this occasion, particularly, not exclusively, but particularly for the vicar here, who I understand is a fabulous singer. Right? Um, I, I heard that. And I'm going to read a poem slash song uh, by Cecil um, uh, Alexander, the great uh, hymnist, 1818 to 1895. She was an Anglo-Irish writer. Uh, she wrote, I'm sure you know, she wrote, uh, Mrs. Alexander, <clears throat> she wrote All Things Bright and Beautiful, if you know that one. Usually coming in at number one. Uh, 
when in Royal David City, often, often charting also. As in, well, this one doesn't chart so much. St. Patrick's Breastplate, uh, her, <clears throat> her translation of the, the so-called Lorica of St. Patrick, I rise today, God's help to guide me, whatever. I used a sort of little statement of purpose. I used to know it off by heart when I was a kid. And uh, I used to know quite a few things when I was a kid. I know less now. But anyway, she, she lived in the vicinity of Derry, Derry, London, Derry, Straban. <clears throat> Her husband was, um, I think, Bishop of Armagh, one or two other dioceses around there. But this is one of her, Cecil Francis Alexander's um, hymns. I myself make no distinction between hymns, poems, songs, it's all one thing, you know? For example, what is, uh, I suppose, I mean, her rough-ish contemporary Emily Dickinson writing. She's writing hymns in, in a very profound sense. <clears throat> Certainly she's deeply influenced by that tradition. <clears throat> if you look at the structure of her poems, there is a green hill far away without a city wall where the dear Lord was crucified who died to save us all. We may not know, are any of you organists? We may not know, we cannot tell what pains he had to bear. But we believe it was for us he hung and suffered there. He died that we might be forgiven. He died to make us good, that we might go at last to heaven, saved by his precious blood. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. Oh, dearly, dearly, has he loved. And we must love him too. And trust in his redeeming blood. And try his works to do. I realize you know, the word redeeming, I'm pretty sure redemption, <clears throat> yeah, is used in that poem by Phyllis Wheatley and redeeming. And of course, I mean, there, there is a kind of, there is a back, story of some notion of slavery in, in that word, to buy back. So certainly some notion of, I think I'm right in saying, of being owned by, by something else or someone else. To redeem, redemptory. Anyway, another Irish connection. You know, I'm sorry. <laughs> what can I do at the present time? in particular, when the Irish are causing so much trouble for the, the backsplasher. What's it called? The back, uh, what's it called? The backlog? No. Anyway, the um, Gerard Manley Hopkins um, was an English poet, of course, but <clears throat> went to Balliol College, Oxford, um, and he, he was received into the Roman Catholic Church by Henry Newman in 1884. He became a professor um, in Trinity College, Dublin. <clears throat> and um, he had a hard enough time in Ireland. He described himself along the way as being at a third remove. I have a bit of trouble in untangling this idea. First of all, he was removed from his family, I think, in the sense that he, he <clears throat> gave up his uh, Church of England um, connection. And then he, I think, he, he um, I mean, there's some question as to what exactly a third remove means. Certainly went from England to Ireland. And I think perhaps 
Um, there's some other notion of a remove. I, I find it hard to follow it on it, to be honest. But he describes him th himself as being at a, uh, any Hopkins ites in the vicinity who might know about this? Hopkins. Third remove. Anyway, he felt out of it. I mean, he was depressive, I'd say. And, um, well, it's not that I'd say, everybody, most people say that. His poems weren't published. He died in, 89, in 1889, as I mentioned. They weren't published until 1918 by Robert, uh, Robert Bridges, famously. And uh, towards the end of his life, partly, uh, I think, under the influence of two things, his, his, his hard time in Ireland, where he really felt he felt out of the swim of what was happening politically, and he felt, as an English person, alas, he, he felt um, he, he didn't quite fit in. And um, he fitted in well enough, I mean, to get the job at TCD, which, I, you know, I'm pretty sure that it was a job at TCD, maybe it was UCD, University College Dublin, that our friend William Butler Yates applied for, and wanted for a professorship. And one of the reasons, I think perhaps only one of the reasons he didn't get the job was that he, he misspelled professor. <laughs> but you know, there's, I, that, I, that come, I'm not making anything off that. Anybody can do that, that's okay. <laughs> but anyway, your man, he got, the job, he got a job over there. So, partly under the influence of his situation in Ireland, partly under the influence of the Don with whom we, um, uh, from whom we heard earlier on, and his um, extraordinary sonnets, the holy sonnets that I mentioned, among many others. <clears throat> um, Hopkins wrote what are described as the, ter the terrible sonnets. But you know what? I like you people. I like you a lot. So I'm not going to read any terrible sonnets. I'm going to read some uplifting sonnets. What do we say? But with a, with a, with a let's try this one. Um, the Windhover to Christ our Lord. The Windhover, as you know, or Windhover is a, a kestrel, a hawk. Um, and, you know, one of the remarkable things about this upbeat poem is that it takes a minute or two to figure out that it is indeed a sonnet. Um, <clears throat> as many of you know, there is a, there's a, an idea uh, which is expressed in Latin, something along the lines of ars celet artem, art conceals art. So for, <clears throat> for example, for rhyming to really work, you're meant not quite to notice it, right? The art conceals the art uh, that, that has gone into, the work that has gone into making it seem that no work has gone into it. And it's only really, I mean, I was looking at this earlier on and sort of puzzling over it and thinking, well, is this really a sonnet? But anyway. <clears throat> So, um, the, the rhymes seem to be riding, uh, king, uh, riding, striding, wing, right? Swing, gliding, hiding, thing. Here, chevalier, deer, and billion, cillion, and gold, vermilion. They're all there, but <clears throat> I'll read it now and we'll see how we get on. I caught this morning's minion, kingdom of daylight's dauphin, dapple dawn drawn falcon, in his riding of the rolling level underneath him, steady air, and striding high there, how he rung upon the rein of a wimpling wing in his ecstasy. Then off, off forth, on swing, as a skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend. Now, wait a minute. I think I may have misread that. On a, 
a bow, yeah, I think it is a bow. I was going to say a bow, but a bow, a bow and bend, on a bow bend. The hurl and gliding rebuffed the big wind. My heart in hiding stirred for a bird. The achieve of, the mastery of the thing. Brute beauty and valor and act, O oh, air, pride, plume, hear, buckle. And the fire that breaks from thee then, a billion times told lovelier, more dangerous, O oh, my chevalier. No wonder of it. Sheer plod makes plough down cillian shine. And blue bleak embers, ah, my dear, fall, gall themselves, and gash gold vermilion. Wonderfully ecstatic. <clears throat> Uh, sense of the, the wind over the kestrel. <clears throat> uh, that word cillian is the word for a furrow, as you know it. I know just a recently overturned mass of uh, kind of shiny, polished earth. <clears throat> it's related, it comes into English from sillon, a breve no sillon, which you might remember uh, if, if ever you find yourself singing the French national anthem, uh, anthem which, which I'm, I'm sure you, you do at times. <clears throat> anyway, um, you know, I'm, I was taken by this word gall. gall fall gall themselves. Uh, obviously, it relates to the humours we were talking about earlier on. <clears throat> it's also, um, this poem is from 1877, mind you, so it might be a wee bit early. It is, I think it probably is, but it is also the, um, an Ir the, the term used in Ireland for a foreigner, the Gael and the Gaul. It's actually related to the word Gaul, G-A-U-L in Gaelic. It's probably a bit early for that. So these are poems that are um, engaged with ideas of freedom, of the hawk, um, some kind of constraint or restraint, the collar, the slavery, literal or metaphorical that I mentioned. And uh, that uh, brings us to this poem, which John uh, Shahad mentioned in his beautiful introduction. Thank you very much. Um, having to do with this implacable hunter down, the god as almost hellhound, right? The hound of heaven. Um, Thompson actually was born in Preston, not too far away. Though he spent most of his life, of course, in, in London. And uh, he, uh, he was, alas, he, he, he had a very rough life, as some of you will know, he, he was an opium addict, quite a, I don't know if there are degrees of opium addiction, I think there are actually. There are some fo functioning opium addicts, or were, I think Coleridge was probably one of them, maybe. Would we say, can we talk about a functioning addict? But then this, this man really was not, had a rough time. Though, I mean, he was recognized for this poem in particular. In 1894, the Bishop of London, um, described this as one of the most tremendous poems ever written. I'm not going to read it all, but I'll give you a little blast of it, uh, because we've, we've got one more poem to read after this. I'll give you a little blast of The Hound of Heaven, which was a poem <clears throat> I was introduced to in that same school I mentioned earlier on, uh, or did I, where, where I was re reading um, Don and Herbert, and we had a new... Um, head of school, um, the school was run by a Catholic order, the Vincentians, Society, and uh, followers of St. Vincent de Paul, quite a, not quite Jesuits, but going in the direction of the Jesuits in the sense that they were extremely intellectually 
um, driven, I'd say. And I remember I was probably 17 when <laughs> this guy arrived in school and he, he wanted each of us to take on a project. Uh, something out of the ordinary, something that, you know, something that was not for our A-levels or whatever it was, O-levels, A-levels. And somehow I got landed with the Hound of Heaven. He said, you should, do, you should write something about that. I said, okay. Anyway, I'll read a little bit of it. I'm not sure. I don't remember anything much about what I said about it. I'll read a little bit of this. It's very long, just to give you the sense of it, because it's kind of Im- implacable. Um, the, the, the driving force of this verse, uh, quite, quite remarkable. I fled him. Down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the mist of tears, I hid from him. And under running laughter, up vistaed slope hopes I spent. That's an an interesting misreading. Up vistaed hopes. It's, ob- it's obviously working with some notion of a slope lurking in the back of it. I think it is. Up vistaed hopes I sped and shot precipitated a down titanic glooms of chasmed fears from those strong feet that followed, followed after. But with unhurrying chase, an unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat. And a voice beat, more instant than the feet. All things betray thee who betrayest me. I pleaded, outlaw wise, by many a hearted casement, curtained red, trellised with intertwining charities. For though I knew his love who followed, yet was I sore a dread, lest having him I should have not beside. Something of that same wit, um, the paradoxical component that's a feature of so many of these poems, <clears throat> but if one little casement parted wide, the gust of his approach would clash it too. Fear wist not to evade, as love wist to pursue. <clears throat> and I'm just uh, naked. Hold on. Lo, not contentest thee who contentst not me same device that's used again and again through the poem. Naked, I wait thy love's uplifted stroke. My harness, piece by piece, thou hast hewn from me and smitten me to my knee. I am defenseless, utterly. I slept, methinks, and woke, and slowly gazing, find me stripped in sleep. In the rash lusty head of my young powers. I shook the pillaring hours and pulled my life upon me, rhymed with smears. I stand amidst the dust of the mounded years. My mangled youth lies dead beneath the heap. My days have crackled and gone up in smoke, have puffed and burst like sun starts on a stream. And boy, he's not kidding when he talks about his days going up in smoke. So anyway, um, that's a, so a sense of the, the hound of heaven. I will move, as it's 20 past eight, <clears throat> in the direction of uh, the man who said that with Francis Thompson, we lost the greatest poetic energy since Browning. Who could that have been? Well, 
it had to be G.K. Chesterton. And G.K. Chesterton, <clears throat> as you know, um, 1874, 1936, we're moving slowly into the modern era here, modernish. <clears throat> um, and uh, with his, his great, one of my very favorite poems with which I'll end, um, a poem dedicated to an animal which again is a beast of burden, is, is working, uh, ne ne next thing to, to being enslaved, um, and uh, a, a, a lowly creature that ha suddenly is raised to its moment of fame and joy. Um, Chesterton described, I think it was in Time magazine, I think it was, as the prince, a prince or the prince of paradox. That theme that's run through these uh, poems. <clears throat> and uh, that puts him in a line that goes right the way back to Herbert and Don, <clears throat> with whom we began. And this is a poem many of you will remember, perhaps a number of you will remember, from your own school days, The Donkey. When fishes flew and forests walked and figs grew upon thorn, some moment when the moon was blood, then surely I was born. With monstrous head and sickening cry and ears like errant wings, the devil's walking parody of all, I beg you, on all four-footed things. The tattered outlaw of the earth of ancient crooked will, starve, scourge, deride me, I am dumb. I keep my secret still. Fools, for I also had my hour. One far fierce hour and sweet. There was a shout about my ears and palms before my feet. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your, um, for your patience. Any observations? Sorry, do you want to say something, Joe? Or thoughts? Yes? Uh, you know, I can't, is, there, is that a microphone? Where is that microphone? Can't quite hear you. I'm sorry. Did you like the um, Hound of Heaven when you were 17? Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I th I'm losing my hearing. My apologies. I did. Um, I did. I mean, <sighs> I mean, I remember <clears throat> this guy knew when I was 17 or 16, whatever it was, that uh, I was interested in writing poems myself. And I suppose that um, he, he, you know, he assigned chores for the, um, the boys. It was an all-boys school. Uh, the, the boys in the lower sixth or the upper sixth or whatever it was. I mean, I say upper sixth. It was basically, it was kind of Billy Bunter on a bog. You know, it was, it, it, <laughs> do you remember Billy? Some do. Perhaps not the younger folk. Billy Bunter, do you know Billy? No, you're. You're, you're, you guys are leading such a healthy life. <laughs> you are. Billy Bunter. How do you explain Billy Bunter? What do you say? I'll say, how do you explain Billy Bunter? How do you, yes, I don't want to try. No, no. Well, Billy Bunter was, you know, there was a whole, 
the English public school, um, <clears throat> I mean, was, for whatever reason, well, actually, I know the reason, was still kind of to the fore of our little minds over across the way, because let's face it, we were um, part of the Great, uh, Great Britain, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So we were reared on uh, British television and among American television and, but, and, Ameri and U UK comics and literature, children's literature. So Billy Bunter, you know, we had a tuck shop, for example. Uh, it was like a parody of an English public school. In our, I'm sure nobody would mind my saying this. Um, that's what it was. Anyway, this, this man, was a, he, was a kind of, he was somewhat enlightened, a very intellectual, very intellectual person, and he really wanted to do his best by us. And to have a long-winded answer to your question, <clears throat> um, he thought I would have a go at the Hound of Heaven, and I did enjoy it, but I think it was slightly, <clears throat> um, what did one say, colored by the fact that I was kind of being pursued by this man in some sense also, and that I was being forced to have a response to the Hound of Heaven. <clears throat> when you get right down to it, um, you know, it's a pretty, in the strictest sense, monotonous line, right? I'm going to follow you down. Um, that's part of its power, is its uh, singularity of theme, purpose, whatever. But <clears throat> uh, I mean, I, 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 quote, I saw that quote earlier. I mentioned that quote uh, where, uh, just to get it right, where um, um, the Bishop of London described it as one of the most tremendous poems ever written. And then, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, G.K. Chesterton with Francis Thompson, we lost the greatest poetic energy since Browning, and I kind of understand what he means by that, but it, it may be ever so slightly overstated. Certainly there's energy in, in, in the thrust of the poem, the force of the poem. Um, it's a little wordy in places, I think, mind you. Any other thoughts? At all? Yeah, I, I was wondering what makes a particular type of poetry, religious poetry. I'd have to ask John. No, um, you know th this was this so is. Are, <laughs> you've, you've referred to poems that are associated with particular traditions. Yes, I have, and perhaps a little, uh, a little, little. Um, what would one say? Um, narrowly in that respect, um, you know. In this case, the, these are poems that, uh, for the most part, are operating within the Christian uh, tradition or um, <clears throat> are having, um, are drawing for their imagery on, on that tradition. So uh, from, a, from a range of um, authors and a range of ages. But of course, there are many other traditions uh, on which uh, you know, one, one might have drawn. Um, but in this case, it's, the imagery, I'd say. You know, I think in some sense, all poems, and all interesting poems, let's say, um, draw upon um, some force beyond the poet um, that <clears throat> is akin to what we think of in terms of organized religion as um, a spiritual force. Um, something that's bigger than us. And many poets, myself included, feel that ideally they are being used by a force beyond themselves. Now, it may be the language, you know? Um, 
but something beyond oneself, something over which one has no control. Um, One steps into the area of the unknown. Um, One goes in, ideally, in ignorance and humility, which is a concept, you know, it's one one of the virtues, I think, in a number of organized religions. So can, can I just explain to you, as I was watching you, the word that came into my mind was communion. As I was watching you, it seemed as though you were communing with words and with people from the past. So, yes. so, so it, it did actually look like watching someone that was engaged in some sort of spiritual activity. Well, I in think... Reading. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, no, I, I fluffed a couple of lines there, partly because I... Yeah, I, 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 but ideally, I, I don't read the poem myself. Um, I know it sounds a bit corny. I may have mentioned this to some students along the way. <clears throat> ideally, the poem reads you or reads one. You give yourself over. You allow it to tell you, to speak through you and to say what it wants to be. Right? Does that sound too corny? No, no, it's not. Um, no. That's, that's the ideal, I believe, yes. So um, that's what was happening in this case, and it was delightful to have this invitation uh, from Professor Shad, and then to, to take part in you know, what is now a, a bit of a series, five, I think it is, of events here. And again, we're so I'm proud, I don't want to be... Uh, saying what you might be saying to him, but we're really very grateful um, to the vicar and to everyone else here. Uh, thank you so much for having us this evening. John, did you want to say a word, maybe? I've um, heard about the Prince of Parad- uh, the, the Prince of Paradox, from the A Prince of Paradox, um, and we thank God for that, and we thank God for you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much.